welcome everyone to Rise Above the Information Diluge, Effective Visualization and Information Management. Today's session is all about uh, enabling you to control the information rather than it controlling you. So um, information overload and uh, information itself in 2016 leaves us in a bit of a catch-22 in that we need all the information that we can get to make the best decisions but unfortunately the more we have the harder it is to make sense of it all um, and what that means is there's actually some really interesting data on this that uh, actually sort of if you think of it like the law of diminishing returns because we're inundated with so much information um, that that load of information actually impacts our decisions in a negative way and we have some very cool research um, the first study I like to talk about is from Temple University uh, Angela DeMonica director for Se at the Center for Neural Decision Making at Temple she actually did uh, combinational auctions where uh, bidding wars where people would bid uh, similar to eBay on landing slots uh, at LAX was the simulation um, so the interesting thing was after a certain number of combinations the more combinations that were thrown into the slots with the more information the bidders then started to uh, cor correlated to making actually in their words stupid decisions bad choices they paid more for less and so forth so that's just one example how um, you know we want to certainly get all the information but at some point uh, it doesn't it doesn't work out and there's a whole decision science behind this uh, another example of this is uh, Sheena uh, Yeager at Columbia University does a lot of great work on decision science uh, happy to tweet out any of her books or studies uh, but the one that I wanted to cite in particular great for business managers listening today as uh, in uh, she did a study where uh, she presented 401k information to participants and again the more information that was presented to the uh, participants that correlated inversely to sign up and participation. So this is kind of an interesting um, idea when you're training new employees, uh, also just HR managers on the call today. Uh, that uh, if people feel overwhelmed, they'll opt out. They, there's sort of a, a negative reaction to that. So how do we deal with all this? I mean, uh, we certainly don't want to negate the information that's there. So um, is there a way to kind of have our cake and eat it too, to embrace the information and all the, the great data that's coming at it, but at the same time not overwhelm and not let it get impede our, uh, our daily lives, our daily decisions, as it, it actually has been proven uh, to do. So um, what I want to talk about is uh, moving away from what I like to call biased forms of information, the information that has a raw format with no semantic context and uh, I think it's really through semantic context that we can uh, gain control of the information and we'll talk about what that means uh, in semantic context a little later on in the session but this would be considered a biased form of information the linear file folder system because it really just exists and has existed from the dawn of the GEM interface, the graphical user interface environment, um, to you know store information. And it's based on the filing cabinet, cabinet metaphor where we're putting things in and, and just creating a large hierarchy, but it is incapable of really uh, you deriving more semantic meaning than the file folder hierarchy and it is interesting because uh, yes I'm showing a version of, of Windows but you can go to Dropbox, Box.net, you can be you know Cloud 2.0, Cloud whatever O and you'll, you're still going to get this um, this hierarchy and this this paradigm so so that's that's okay and certainly has its place but we're really not going to conquer all of the research that we need or all the data that's coming at us by using uh, files and folders um, so what we want to do is uh, rise above it and we're going to talk today specifically about 
Uh, first of all, just workflows and psychological strategies. Whether or not you're using the brain, you're going to be able to take away a little bit of information, uh, information science and, and strategies just to help you organize this type of thing in your daily life. And then beyond that, how we can apply that to capture tools like the brain. So um, we're going to start off by talking a little bit about different information sources and what I have here is a classification and it's it's not necessarily black and white um, some of these things you could argue argue are also a flow tool and not just a capture tool um, and vice versa but to distinguish um, how to sort of ride the wave uh, we have a flow of information so the flow is coming you can think of it like like the Santa Monica Ocean right and uh, what you want to do is you want to ride the wave you want to get into the flow and enjoy the flow but be able to leave the flow without the flow overwhelming you or sucking you under that that great undercurrent so that the flow tools are Twitter email I am text messages Facebook phone calls, these are things that are coming at you. And you don't necessarily think about it that way, but it's, it, they're very invasive. They're, they're not asking you, uh, Shelly, Matt, do you have time for me right now? There's breaking, no, they're, say, they're interrupted by their very nature. They're saying, uh, you know, look, this is happening, there's a message. So it's, it's incumbent on you to control the flow, but there's this little problem. We all secretly admit, and I'm, I'm just as bad as anyone else, I admit I'm a Google News junkie, is we like the flow. We like all that stuff coming at us. So is there a way then to uh, enjoy the flow without not getting anything done? And that's where capture tools come in. So what a capture tool is, it's going to allow you to pick stuff from the flow and store it so I can look at it later. So lo and behold, when I see a really cool article on Google News about uh, maybe new AI or some new technology, I don't have to stop what I'm doing. I don't have to stop my webinar or my meeting. I can simply drag and drop that into my brain for reading, come back to it at the end of the day and not worry that it's going to be gone or buried in the news stream. So that's what a capture tool lets you do. It essentially lets you freeze time and go back in time, back into that flow and get that information. So in terms of capture tools, mind maps certainly can function as capture tools. Note taking software, great. I, I am going to, you know, file folder directors, yes, at the end of the session, if you want to start using a folder as a capture tool, go ahead. We're going to be a little bit disappointed, but you can do that. And then, of course, uh, larger knowledge management systems, information portals, those are all great capture tools. Um, now, sometimes, and we'll, we'll get into this a little uh, later on, you can have so many capture tools that they also become part of the flow and you need to start connecting things. Like uh, I've worked with clients, they have a really great Microsoft SharePoint integration as well as a human resources portal and their shared file folder directory and then what other maybe wiki that they're using. So, you know, four or five great capture tools, capture in quote, but then they need that all integrated together. So, um, you know, kind of like the Inception movie, there are degrees or layers of capture. So um, what I'd like to show you is how to position the brain as that final degree of visualization and capture over all these sources so that you can take control of the information. So in addition to tools, I do want to talk a little bit about mastering the psychology of information overload and give credit to where credit is due some of the theorists that are fabulous uh, so you can walk away with some great reading uh, if you want to read a little bit more about this uh, what i recommend is setting up rules of engagement for your information sources setting priorities and uh, priorities for your projects and your information so we have a lot of executives that they just won't go into email between like 11 to 1 in the afternoon. So what they will do, email in the morning, email at the end of the day, and that's sort of their way of focusing on what they need to do. Um, methodologies that will specifically at, um, help with that are David Allen's Getting Things Done and Stephen Covey's Priority Matrix. And what David Allen does is he takes it a step further. He actually treats your commitments 
as information objects themselves. So rather than just saying, oh my gosh, I've got all these documents and Google News items to organize, he's going to say to you, do you also have to pick up your kids at six? Are you renovating your garage? List all those commitments. So you want a system, a trusted system, a capture tool that lets you brain dump, brain dump stuff in your head, your commitments, as well as your information. Those are all objects. In our case, we like to call them thoughts. And you put it all together and you know that it's magic and you're wonderful and you're, you're surfing the wave. So how do we do this? Um, information architecture is absolutely critical. So um, I like to say, you know, become your own information ar architect. Um, what you want to do is create a knowledge hub that is more than search. So search is great if you know what you're looking for, but if not, you, uh, you're constantly just using search. And in fact, you can, you can kind of test yourself. Do you have a nice place we can go, maybe activate a document, uh, browse around and find things relatively easy? Or are you constantly using for search to find your documents? And if you are, that tells you you need a more productive, more conceptual information environment. Um, multiple co contexts and workflows. So what you can do with information architecture is actually map out workflows, project phases, so that as your data grows, it's growing in a way that supports your daily activity. Um, there's a couple questions that you can ask yourself as you're getting started. Because you might be thinking, well, this sounds great. Lovely, I have a brain, and uh, you know, or I just downloaded the software. You know, this sounds very challenging, great in theory, but how do we actually do this in reality? So there are about four questions you can ask yourself as a new brain user and also as an existing brain user. You might have a 2,000 thought brain, but it's all on research and you haven't thought about really using it to master your, your daily workflows and it interruptive inf information sources as well. So first of all, what I always tell people, what are your key projects? What are those things keeping you up at night? Where do you want to spend the most of your time? Now, note I say want because you might actually be surprised how distracted you are and how little time you're spending on your key projects because you're interrupted by other commitments and these other things. So that's where um, this, this, this system of knowledge, uh, this trusted capture tool of yours is really going to help you calibrate and stay focused. Uh, what URLs and websites are you constantly going? Are you constantly going to your HR site and digging for the new application employee document? Um, if so, you know, just, just drag and drop that link into your brain or capture it into whatever tool you're using what files and documents do you access frequently those should be right there right where you need them and then how is the information used when do you need to use it so these are all questions that we're going to answer in building a brain so with that I'm going to close the presentation and we're actually going to get into some brain building here um, so in this particular brain is a brain on everything. We'll come back to that. What I want to do is actually create a brand new brain and I'm going to call this 2016 uh, My Solution to Digital Sanity. So My Now I just want to let everyone know I'm sort of going to go through this quickly, so you're going to get more of the principles of how to do this than the practicalities. Um, we do have a Brain 101 class tomorrow where we're going to go through much slowly or building a brain for ground, from ground up. That being said, if I am covering anything too quickly or I'm missing a feature, um, definitely address that in the Q&A and we'll try and cover that. Uh, I'm going to start out just building a context and then after that, um, Matt Caton, who is patiently sitting here, is going to then jump in with additional data sources as well, and he's monitoring the Q&A right now, so uh, feel free to chat in. So uh, what you want to do when you're starting a brain is you want, in this case, I want to think about all the key domains in my life or business that I need to, to, to work on, I need to control. And with that, I'm going to create thoughts. But in this case, rather than just thinking about, oh, I'm, I'm putting all these thoughts in my brain, think of the thoughts as digital buckets, buckets for stuff that you need to capture and get out of the flow. So I'm going to have a, a bucket or a 
what, what really we call a thought for my company, my team. I'm going to put an area in for personal projects. Now notice I'm using the semicolon to create multiple thoughts at, at once. So I've got those in there. And now what I'm going to do is just stuff that I tend to get distracted on. These are what I call my, my remediation thoughts. In a sense, uh, I love things to read. I will be, you know, I, I like to periodically go to Google News, but then I don't, I don't want to be sitting there reading the news all day. I'd never get things done. So I have a thought called things to read. So at the end of the day, and sometimes it's more like the end of the week or a Saturday morning, I'll go back to my thought on things to read. And uh, this is where, you know, that particular area is almost like a snippet tool where you're dragging, dropping, dropping links. And when you have time at the end of the day, that's when you can go and do that. I also have another thought. You can see, you know, these, these, this doesn't have to be rocket science. It doesn't have to be a highfalutin name. I, I'm going to put another thought in here called things to buy. I love shopping on Amazon. I have a bunch of stuff to do, but sometimes somebody will call me or mention like a really cool gadget for my kitchen. I don't want to stop everything, but it's just going to be filed away in, in things to buy. And when I'm ready to buy or I'm on Amazon, I can go ahead and do that. And this is great, by the way, for holidays, people's birthdays, Christmas. I actually have thoughts for everyone and my friends and family in the brain. So when I see something, but it's not necessarily time to buy, I'll link it to their name. And then they're always like, wow, this is such a thoughtful gift. How would you think about it? Because I can never think about what to buy someone like two weeks before Christmas or their birthday, but um, you know, two months later, I have that great idea. So this is this is where your brain becomes your digital uh, memory. So you're taking ideas from your head, you're taking ideas from the internet, you're putting them in a place where you can retrieve them when you need them because sometimes we have the best ideas at the wrong time and sometimes we have it's the wrong time for the best idea so this sort of aligns time with uh, your thinking and with your information assets uh, okay so now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to start mapping out a few other areas so uh, we can actually address information and information sources um, so my company I'm going to have a section for operations IT, sales, and marketing. And of course, there's a lot more I can do with these thoughts. I can add icons, but I want to start on a project. So uh, getting back to those questions, what projects are keeping me up at night? So in this case, I'm going to uh, have a hypothetical human resources training website that I'm building with my team. So I'm going to put that in. This is a training site for new employees and of course I can come in here and the brain lets me know if I'm spelling anything incorrectly and I can adjust that or right click and get the correct spelling and now I've got that thought in my brain and now what I want to start doing I am going to go ahead here and just add a quick icon so let me just go ahead and select an icon we do have an icon library of over 1500 icons so my human resources training site it starts like this, this is going to be the place where it all comes together so uh, I can actually go out to the web I can use the brains search web feature and in this case I'm actually soliciting information and data um, and looking for stuff on how to build a great human resources training site and uh, there's a couple different sites um, and links to seminars that I might want to recommend on our site. So all I have to do is drag and drop any URL into the brain and that captures it. So I'm going to go ahead and drag the American Management Association and drop that right under our site because they're, they're a great model for us to look at. Let me go ahead again and drag and drop another URL. Uh, let me go ahead and use the uh, HRTrainingCenter.com site as well. Now you can see um, it can be any URL. So this can be if you're a sales rep, 
Um, in salesforce.com, each contact has a unique URL. If you are using Microsoft SharePoint, that will also have a unique URL. So um, any path that you have to information, and Matt's going to show us a little bit more even with Google Docs and things of that nature, um, simply drag and drop. Now I can drag it on a thought and link it on that thought, or if I drag below, I'm creating child thoughts here. So you can see I've just gone ahead and added two more thoughts to this particular brain. Now, of course, I can add new information if I want to build my new requirements document. So actually, I can just comma requirements. And that's a little trick to get the first name of the parent in the thought name. So now I've got the requirements, human resources website requirements document. And in this case, I'm actually going to add an attachment. And this will be a Microsoft Word document. And I can start typing uh, the requirements for this site. And then I just save that, and that gets saved back into the brain. So these are sort of a few new things. Now the other thing is this particular site, I'm going to be working on it. I'm not working on it by myself. I actually want to get Matt involved. So I'm going to go ahead and add Matt to this brain. And I'm linking him as a jump because I, he's not really an information asset, so he doesn't belong below. But uh, he is a jump thought, and then I want to link him up to my team thought, which I created. And so now I can simply type in the first couple letters of team. It shows me all my existing thoughts. So you always get that discovery, select it. And so now I've got Matt under team. And if I want to add other team members, maybe Patrick and Jane and Travis, I can go ahead and do that. And if I also want to go ahead and add Patrick to this human resources training website, I can do that as well. So now you can see I've got a couple people um, that I'm going to be working with. Now, one of the advantages of the brain is that one piece of information uh, typically falls under multiple buckets. And then this is a new brain that I'm just starting out, so it, not too many connections right off the get-go, but as you build your brain, you'll see how powerful it becomes to cross-reference and cross-link. And what that does is that builds that semantic network, that context, that helps you understand and gives your, your data structure more meaning. So in this case, human resources, um, this also needs to go under operations. This is not simply an IT project, this is an operations. So I'm going to go ahead and connect operations as a parent thought to human resources. So now you can see if I come into IT and I'll have other stuff in here eventually, I can get to this. But if I'm also thinking about this, from an operations perspective, I could also get to that particular project that I'm working on as well. Now, uh, so that's really cool. I don't have to duplicate that or, or decide what folder. Do I want in my IT folder or my operations folder? The brain pretty much lets me connect to anything, and that does really help me. Uh, when linking things. Now, um, existing, integrating existing information is just as easy. So uh, I've got an article on a department survey that we did as well as some department requirements. I need to get those into the brain as well. They're scattered across different folders. So I can simply drag and drop this department requirements document into my brain. And what that does is that creates a shortcut to where that uh, file lives. Now, the brain is perfectly fine letting me leave it as a shortcut. Um, again, it can be that, um, you know, that uh, superordinate remote control for all your information. The only thing and the only caveat there is if you're syncing this brain to the cloud, we can't sync shortcuts. You ha that, that file has to be internally, or if you're doing a team brain, which you know, good, good grief, uh, information overload for one person, but when you get team members involved, uh, architecture and visualization is even more important. So a lot of our team brain users, you know, we're, they're going to be sharing the documents in the relevant semantic context. 
So in this case, I have two options. I can move this file into the brain, which I actually want to do because this folder is a disaster and I need to, to get rid of it. Or I can copy it. That's fine, too. So in this case, I'm going to move. If it was just me on my desktop or if everyone had access to the drive, if it was like a shortcut to a shared drive, you could leave it as a shortcut. Um, but just a word for those of you taking advantage of our cloud services. In fact, there is even an option in Preferences uh, in the UI, the, on the drag and drop of files, instead of linking them to actually have them move in immediately. So if you're uh, have, setting up your cloud services, I highly recommend that as well. Okay, so I've got my department acquirement requirements. Now, customer services back practices, let me just show you. I can right click and copy, and I can also come back over here and paste that in my brain. So now you can see I'm building the information, but I'm building it in a way that makes sense for me um, because the other thing that's interesting about that is now I can make further connections like department requirements. That's something that I actually want to connect Travis to um, because he wrote this document and it's also the people that are going to be using this the most are actually in the sales area of the company. So I want to link that under sales. So when I'm talking to sales, I can reference their requirements and ask them, do you need anything more? Is there anything more? So even though the project is a human resources uh, training site overseen by operations and IT, the user of the information turns out to be sales. So they're connected. So when I'm doing anything more on those department requirements, I've got a link to Travis and I've got sales. So you can see how nicely um, that comes together. Now, integrating other large information sources is also interesting. I can actually import full folders. So let me go ahead and do this. I have an IT management folder. It's got all kinds of great stuff that we're going to use. Um, it is, there's going to be some database management. It's going to integrate with VoIP, and we have all kinds of project planning in there. So you can see that these folders have other things in them. And I just want to get this full folder into my brain. Now, of course, what I can do is I can drag and drop a uh, this folder just like this. Oh, and I actually have my virtual thoughts uh, turned on, so I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that. That is not the default setting when you drag and drop a folder. It's supposed to create a shortcut, so I will also show you that. Um, what a virtual thought does, these I recommend if you have um, a folder that's constantly being updated outside of your brain, um, you can actually create virtual thoughts for these folders. And the thing that's cool about a virtual thought um, that is a preference that I actually have turned on. So let me go back to look and feel. Right here, show virtual thoughts for folder. If you click this or have this checked, which I did, I do in this brain, um, when you drag and drop a folder, it actually takes the folder structure and mimics it, but the, it's, it's a virtual thought in that it doesn't exist in your brain. So it's, it's not great, to be honest, if you are syncing data, but it is really cool if you just want to visualize a folder structure outside of your brain um, on your hard drive or on your shared network drive. So for instance here, if I add another folder here, and I'll just call this... Um, IT new projects, and I've got that. So what I can do, now you can see my IT new projects folder is appearing and updating here as well. So that's one way we can deal with these, these lovely folders that I know you all have so many of that need to be organized more effectively. Uh, now I want to go back to preferences, go into UI, and I'm going to uncheck this because I want to also show you, because that's the default, and uh, so if I uncheck that, uh, you know, I don't really get the, I don't get the virtual thought anymore, but what I can do, for instance, is I can drag and drop a, pro, a folder in, my website project, for instance, which has a lot of great information, and the default here will be just to create a shortcut to that folder, so I can launch that folder. Now, that's really cool, especially if you have a really useful folder, but it's buried in a gigantuan file folder directory structure, go ahead and create that shortcut to it. And then, you know, hey, maybe it's not just me that this is about. This is about marketing. So now I can have one folder that was buried in my large uh, folder directory under the project that I need it, as well as connected 
to marketing where they're going to discover it and use it too. So you can see again, we're creating these paths of discovery, these paths of context that are going to deliver information to me, to anyone I share this brain with at the right time. Now, the final way we deal with folders is we can do that import that I was talking about earlier. So I'm going to go up to file and select import. Import is a fabulous, fabulous area in the brain. If you haven't uh, gone into file and, and clicked on import, do so. You'll have so much fun. Um, you can import template brains or just create new, that's a whole other topic which maybe we'll get into in the Q&A if any of you are interested. I can do folders, I can do IE favorites, I can do uh, mind jet, mind map files, uh, free mind, um, all kinds of things. But in this case, I'm just gonna go ahead and import a folder. So what I do is I simply browse to that folder, which is IT management in this case. I'm going to hit save. It's gonna say, do I wanna proceed? Yes, absolutely. And I'm hitting OK. And now this is, by the way, this is the way to do it if you want to get all that folder information, not only in your brain, but then syncing it to the cloud. Use the folder import. The other thing that's cool is it doesn't really, it's not going to change that folder that's sitting on your desktop. So it's still there. I actually will delete it because it's now imported in my brain because I don't need redundant sets of information. But just so you know, if you try it, you know, it's not, it's not going to mess with the original source. So here, uh, oopsie, let me go back up here. Here, what you can see, I've got IT management, and so I'll just open that so you can kind of see the difference in the brain versus uh, in a folder, the folder system. And you might ask, well, why would you want to do that? You have, you have the folder structure. Well, a couple reasons. Uh, first of all, database management. Uh, again, that's something that not only belongs under IT, but that's a whole other area in engineering that I want to develop, but engineering has to go back at the top of my company. So now you can see that stuff that's buried, again, can be connected to other things in the brain. And then beyond that, I can actually go ahead and get documents, have documents here. So the project planning stuff this is all relevant. This is great stuff for, uh, first of all, we did, we did this, we have the IT budget. So you can see the contents of this folder, 2016 IT project planning. I'll just open it. This had three documents in it. So the way the brain does that import is it attaches all three documents to that thought. Now, of course, if you want to have those documents as separate thoughts in your brain, that's very easy. You have the thought tab here. All you have to do is drag up from the thought tab and it's actually then it, it makes them separate or you can keep them attached as three. But this is really helpful because first of all, this target IT budget, um, I'm actually going to come over here and create what I call a pin, what we call a pin, which is a link to uh, where that file needs to go. So let me just go ahead and create a pin there. And so now regardless of where I am, I always have that budget at the foremost of my brain. And in fact, this is the human resources training website project. I probably want to link that at the very top level right here. So you can see now it's, it was under the project planning thought, but it's also right at the top level of this brain. And pins are fabulous. Pins are really great. Um, then I might want to actually go ahead and I'll go into another section of my brain. Let's go back to sales. And maybe I want to also pin those project requirements. If you're dealing with a lot of information, I highly recommend you create pins so you can move very quickly to those key pieces of information very nicely in your brain. And then finally, there's one other data source that I, I absolutely need to cover, and it's so great. We actually have a Twitter search integration, because I know in addition to, to grabbing websites and documents, there's a lot of great information on Twitter. So um, let's say in the process of doing my human resources training, I just want to get a Twitter, I just want to get the Twitter ha handle in for mind mapping because maybe we're going to use some mind mapping techniques for this human resources training site. So I can preview this hashtag or I can just create a thought for it, which I'm going to do. And what you'll see here is I get the little Twitter icon right here and I can click out to this 
And I've just got everything right away on mind mapping on that hashtag. Uh, that's really cool too. There might be another productivity area. And of course, let me go back and show you the way that's done. I just hit options and I go to the Twitter search and I can also just start typing in GTD. I can do a search on Twitter and preview that as well. So I don't necessarily have to connect it right away because maybe it's just, uh, you know, somebody interesting like David Allen, the GTD guy. Maybe I just want to make sure we get him in the site. So I can actually then just go to his Twitter page, of course, and drag and drop David Allen into the brain. You can see it shows you right away the GTD guy's Twitter account, and I can launch Twitter that way. But actually, and in operations, we want to get really efficient. What I want to do is go back to options. I actually just like the Twitter hashtag. Um, so that little hashtag, I mean, you can type the hashtag in. It'll automatically put that up. GTD, and I don't, I can preview this, but I know it's just going to be a bunch of fabulous stuff. GTD stands for getting things done. We referenced David Allen a little bit earlier in the, in the PowerPoint, and actually we'll show you a little bit more. So I'm just going to create that thought. And, you know, I've got that in my brain. So now you can see in operations, I've got my, my full project. And I've also got, I'm also tracking everything on that particular handle. And I can just launch that and see what's going on on that hashtag there on Twitter. So that's the way it all comes together. There's a lot more I could show you. Um, really quickly though, I'm going to uh, go to a larger brain and just talk a little bit about information prioritization before I pass things over to Matt. Um, so uh, in terms of GTD, uh, you can actually use it to prioritize. You can collect process and organize your commitments in the brain. And we actually have a really great template if you are interested um, in, uh, let me just show you the template on brainstorming that goes over the GTD principles that you can utilize in your own brain. But for me, for organizing commitments, I will have links to my action items this week, so everything I need to do, as well as my um, active projects, which in the GTD context is my 10,000 foot brain. So these are all my projects that I'm working on now. Now you'll notice that um, certain projects, when I mouse over them, they have a color and an icon. That's to prioritize. So if I have multiple con uh, projects, I can actually see which ones are most relevant. So I do that with thought types, and I can also do that with thought tags. Um, now, a thought type lets you uh, add another level of semantic meaning to your thoughts. So in here in my new 2016 website design, I've got, you know, quite a bit, of, I've got six different things that we're focusing on for the project, but you can see um, the new company brochure, we, it really needs to be done before we can get going. So that's the green lighted project there. And then I also have a, a thought type for my action item, so I can see everything that I need to do. And it's very easy to, if I have a new project, so let me just say I need to create new home page content. I can go ahead and do that. And then I can go ahead and type right here. If that's a green lighted project or if that's my action item, I can just come in here and select that as a type and hit OK. And now you can see that also appears with the right icon and color and of course creating a new thought type let's say my new customer agenda create uh, warrants a new thought type i can just simply click on that and i can call this uh, customer service and then hit ok and then i'm just creating a new thought type here where i can come in and add a color so maybe the customer service thought type is always in yellow and i can even give it an icon customer service uh, maybe a ladybug just because we're friendly. So you can see I've got that uh, thought type that I've created as well. So that's thought types. The other thing that I can do is tag my, in my information, my thoughts. So uh, you can see here this hiring a web design firm, I've got some tags, six months high investment. So this just enables me to know out of everything that I need to do for this project, what what additional uh, context is involved. And you can look at this the other way. So let's say, let me go to my tags and uh, I can go ahead and uh, let's say all of a sudden my department gets a bunch of budget. So because I have uh, something for um, 
high investment or low cost or high cost. I can look at different things and go ahead and uh, p pull them up at a moment's notice. So for instance, if I want to know everything that's low cost, maybe I don't get the budget. I've, I have a tag for that. So that means I can do technology partnerships. Serve, a customer service strategy, an e-commerce launch, but not the other projects. Or uh, if I want to know what some stuff that's only going to be that I can do in a six-month time frame, because I have a tag for that, here's all my thoughts that are pulling up. You can also tag and contextualize based on location. I have a tag for London trips. So every time I go to London, I work with a certain firm that's there. I focused on, on channel design and I had, we had a new employer training program. So that was tagged as well. I also love as one of my tags when talking to the CEO. So that's great. You can create a new tag. Um, or you can just tag things like web design meetings. Uh, hiring a web design firm, maybe uh, maybe I want to uncheck that as six months because we're doing it now. So, uh, so we can get rid of things as well. And uh, let me just make my brain a little bigger here so you can see what's going on and uncheck high investment because I found a new company to do it that was low cost. So now it's low cost, the project is smaller, I can do it in a two month time frame. So here you can see I am adding tags. And then I can do the same thing with my thought types as well. Um, I can come in from my thought type perspective. So I have a thought type called my action item. And I, I like to use thought type. Now keep in mind a thought type takes on the primary at, uh, characteristic and, and attribute of a thought. I can only have one thought type per thought, but I can have multiple tags. So here, I'll use this thought type because I like to see a, a nice color and icon by everything that is my action item in a meeting. So for instance, lease renewal. This was something that happened in operations. It's all there, but I know this purple uh, thought type uh, with the arrow and the, the color means that you know, out of all these things, I don't need to worry about all these things. I need to be aware of them, but this is my Mac action item right here. Um, and so that's a little bit on thought types and tags. Well, I'm sure Matt will have a few of those to cover, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass presenter over to Matt now because we're going to continue on sort of the, the theme of conquering these different data sources, and Matt's going to cover even more uh, in, information integration uh, in, in integrating more data sources into the brain. So Great. Well, thank you, Shelley. And I'd like to first start off in really addressing the, the focus of our presentation today, which is visualizing and managing information within the brain and within other data sources. So I'm going to go ahead and show my screen and just really start out with showing a side-by-side -side example file and folder system versus the brain and the advantages that we have with visualizing that information and maintaining it, managing it, and providing additional context. So I've saved, saved us a lot of time by going directly to a very specific PowerPoint that I'm looking for. Um, it took me some time, to be honest with you, to dig through this folder system to find the document. I knew I had used the document for a couple of different clients in the past, but I couldn't remember the actual title, something about the future or why choosing our company, uh, but I couldn't remember specifically. Eventually I found it, I dug through um, my directory system and here in eSolutions Consulting uh, under my marketing corporate files archived, there it is. It's a document called The Winning Edge. That's the one that I was looking for. I finally found it, opened it up, yes, that's it. And that's what I'm gonna use for this client. But then I started thinking, have I shown this document to this client in the past? Uh, maybe they used to be an old customer. Uh, they didn't sign on for a few years, so the contract fell through. Now suddenly we are finessing this client once again. We want to bring them back on board. We've got some great ideas. But I don't want to go back in and my first presentation show them a presentation that, that they've seen before. Uh, so I need to show them something fresh, something new. And obviously this document doesn't provide that type of information for me. I've got my document um, and I can doctor the document up to make it new and exciting and fresh, but if they've seen it before, it's going to lose a little bit of its, its pizzazz. So let's go ahead and take a look in the brain. So in the brain, I can go down into my clients and I'll start with that same thought process that I've used before. Gosh, it was a, a uh, 
a presentation that I used uh, for one of my top clients, which was Time Warner. I'm um, not going to be showing it to Time Warner, but I know they saw it, and we had a great reaction from them. I go into reach, reach out, and there it is, the winning edge. But notice right away, the winning edge falls under my reach out ad campaign where it was used once. It also falls under AT&T sales presentation. I use this this particular uh, PowerPoint for AT&T as well. I also could have simply clicked down through marketing, key presentations, and found it that way. Um, additionally, I've got it linked to my co-presenter, Fred Baxter. Um, I could have found Fred. Gosh, Fred and I give this really great team presentation. I can click through an org chart that I've mapped out here in my brain. And there, of course, is Fred linked up to all of his different responsibilities, people that report to Fred, um, customers that he's worked with, and of course, this document that we're working on together, the winning edge. So already the brain is providing me with greater context of my information. And this directly speaks to a question that actually came in directly, I believe it was from Steve, uh, that asked about overlap. How do you manage overlap? And the brain is really, really great for that in that I'm not creating duplicates of information. If I had my folder system and I wanted to see in my folder system the winning edge was used by client A, B, C, and D. It was also used with other people and it, it falls under archive documentation and so forth. It, it fits a lot of different categories, fits into a lot of different categories. And the brain can manage, maintain that, visualize that for you very, very easily without information duplication. So I'm not simply copying this document and pasting it in all of my other client folders. It's one document and it's simply linked to the different clients that have seen it and the people that I've worked with and et cetera. So all that information visualized for me. And let's take that even one step further. I'm going to open up now down below my tool tabs and right here on the notes, I can see I'm keeping track of dates that it was used and, and presented almost a year ago today. That was a long time ago, and my own organic onboard brain doesn't always remember, ooh, when did that happen? I took uh, uh, diligent notes. Anytime I use this presentation, I drop it right here in the notes. Uh, my new client is going to be called Power Surge. Um, so I'm just going to take a quick note. Power Surge. And of course, I'll simply timestamp that with the date that that presentation takes place. And I can modify that time if I need to. But now I simply know I've got it on uh, record when this presentation was used specifically for which client. And I'm keeping track of that in the notes. Some other things that I have in the notes as well, since Shelly was speaking about getting things done, um, I like to reference that I use the notes section quite extensively in the brain. And again, it provides more context. Yes, the, uh, the Winning Edge presentation, all the documents, um, uh, the slideshow, it's all there. But sometimes there's information about the slideshow that I need to keep track of that's not part of the document itself. And that all takes place for me in the notes. And I simply have a checklist. I've already started this, uh, gearing up for refreshing this document for my client, a few tasks that I need to uh, to take care of, and I'm even going to add one new one here really quick. So just a simple rewrite with uh, Power Surge in mind. So keeping uh, in mind what this client does, what their interests are, I'll sort of refocus the document as I'm creating it. And as I check things off, if I've rewritten that document, I checked, made sure I've got the updated sales figures in there. I can simply check those off my list as I go. Now, let's say I want to actually use this document again in the future for other customers. I really like this document. It's, it's a nice overview of my company and how we do things. Um, but I don't want to have to rewrite it all the time, and I sometimes want to just fall back on the default, the original document that wasn't created with a specific type of company in mind. So before I do this rewrite, I'm simply going to make a copy, and I'll keep track of of version control in the brain as well. Quite often we're reusing those same documents over and over, but with a twist uh, with, with the latest results or sales figures for 2016, 17, and so forth. So I just simply select this document and right from the brain, I like to copy and paste and I can rename this. So this is the winning edge for 
power surge. So I'll take off that copy of. And once again, now I can open this document, make my modifications. I still have that original that was uh, created earlier. Now I've got my copy that is specifically focused for Power Surge. So I might have dozens of different copies of documents here, and I'll keep track of which one was used for which client over here in the notes. And I'll now connect this also to my Power Surge client. So connect that to Power Surge, who does not exist yet in my brain. Now they do. And I can connect Power Surge to a new category that I'm going to create. So notice if I jump right back over to my eSolutions, I come down to Clients. I've got three different client categories, Top Clients, clients by industry and clients by service type. Well, I've got a new category and that is quite simply prospective clients. So I'll create a new thought. And I will connect prospective clients to Power Surge. So I'll just simply start typing in a few letters and the brain again helps me reduce duplication and keep track of well-managed visualization of all my information. So I don't want multiple thoughts for Power Surge, just one. And so I'll double click in that existing thought list. Now that new thought is right there, Power Surge appearing under my prospective clients. Now I'd like to share a few more examples with you of how we can incorporate with all different types of that multitude of data that's coming your way. And what I'm referring to now is um, online file sharing. It's become very popular, cloud computing, um, and there's so many different types. There's a deluge of different types of file sharing and cloud computing that are out there. And of course, I'm referring to OneNote, Dropbox, uh, Evernote, Google Drive, you've heard of them all. You probably have tried using one or two, and whether you use them or not, we're always being inundated with files that are coming our way. Even though I don't use Dropbox, I have clients that do use Dropbox, and when they want to share a file, they send me a link to their Dropbox. So suddenly, I'm using Dropbox. And so there's a lot to keep track of, and the brain is a great way to bring that all together to give me easy access to all the information even if I don't specifically have an account or don't use that uh, uh, that online um, file storage service so I'm gonna go ahead and open up uh, my browser and here in my browser I've got a few different samples open so I've got Google Drive open uh, Google Docs Google Drive very popular these days and when I receive a file and have got a sample account open uh, the important thing to point out and this is uh, the common thread that runs all through these different applications is that everything comes with a URL everything has a share link they talk a lot about the, the share links that are available and since the brain can connect to any type of digital information these URLs are perfect for linking right into the brain so I can simply uh, open a document or even right click now Google Drive there are different ways to get to these share links with Google Drive I usually right click and select to get the link and so there I can just copy that link that shows up and right here in the brain under Power Surge, let's say this is a uh, project overview that I'm using for Power Surge, I can right click in the background and simply paste web link. And so yes, I wanna paste that in and I can very easily rename this as well. Obviously it picks up the name of the document. Different um, applications, OneDrive, uh, uh, Google Drive, um, um, sorry, Dropbox. Uh, they sometimes name the files differently. Um, and actually, I've got Evernote here. That's one of them. Evernote, I typically get a little thing that says, welcome to Evernote when I link in, even though it's linking to a specific document. You can easily rename those. So let's get to one of those. There, I've copied something in from uh, my Google Drive. Let's jump right over to Dropbox. 
Now, typically, if you have an account, if you have a Dropbox account, you typically have a local directory of all of your Dropbox files as well. And you can use that the same way that Shelly showed us with dragging and dropping files, making a link. Um, you probably don't want to, in that case, move the file into the brain, so you just want a shortcut to the, uh, the local file. But also, we can grab links to the online version. Um, and so that's what I'm demoing today. Let's go ahead, and I've got another document here, this Getting Started PDF. Um, uh, Dropbox makes it very easy. I can just click on that link to copy and once again, paste right, whoops, there we go, paste right into the brain. So I right click and paste that web link and there's that Getting Started PDF. Now I dropped that in the wrong place. No worries, everything that you put into the brain can always be modified and edited. So I'm just going to drag this uh, Dropbox link right over to the right to make that a sibling thought of Project Overview. And that links it up underneath Power Search. So now I've got my link to my PDF uh, that's out in Dropbox. I've got my link to my Google Drive document. Let's go ahead and grab Evernote. I saw a question come in about Evernote and specifically OneNote as well. So. I'll bring those in as well. So Evernote is loading up, and again, it's the same process. Everything that appears here in Evernote, there's always just different ways to get to it. With Evernote, I just click on my little context menu, copy the note link, which is really nice because that cleans it up and, and puts the link right on my clipboard for me. Once again, in the brain, I right click and paste that web link. So there we can see Evernote's little welcome back sign. Now let me share with you as well. So I'll just simply rename this to my, uh, let's see what this one was called. I think this is uh, on-site visit. So easily just rename that, and of course I have an easy link back into uh, to Evernote. Um, but I also want to share OneNote with you as well. So let's open up OneNote. OneNote is really interesting um, in that all the different components of OneNote have their own URL. So you've got links to uh, notebooks. If I right click, you'll see I can copy the link to the notebook. If I come down to an actual chapter, uh, right click, and I copy the link to that selection. And you can even copy links to graphics and paragraphs. I right click in a paragraph, copy the link to the paragraph. So every itty bitty little component within OneNote has its own unique URL, which is really interesting. Um, and I can copy that link to the paragraph and once again right click back in the brain and paste that web link. So all my icons are identifying the actual source that they're coming from. Um, I can leave further information in the notes, but obviously now easily accessible. Five different application types um, all linked and accessible through one application, which is the brain. So I can get to all those different components. Now one last and final thing I wanted to share with you. Shelly showed us some great examples of using those uh, thought types and tags, but I want to share with you um, how it can provide you with further context, further information, and really help uh, your brain to grow and evolve. Um, and that, and that is through the search. So the brain has a very powerful search. Anything that I'm bringing into the brain, obviously all the file names, but all of my internal file attachments, uh, web links, they're all being indexed and therefore searchable from within the brain. So if I'm doing a quick search for, let's say I wanna find that document, the winning edge, I'll just type in a few letters, there it is, the winning edge, and I'll go directly to that thought. That's called the instant search. So anytime I type something in the search box, I'm getting all of the thought matches, but I can do a more extensive search. Um, I'll do a search for the word future. So there I do have some PowerPoints that reference future, but that's none of those are the PowerPoints that I'm looking for. So I'm going to click on the search button and that takes me over to the search tab where again, my first grouping are all of the thought matches. My second grouping is wherever future is contained within a document, within a web page. Uh, maybe it's uh, appearing in my notes. Um, so there's a lot of different examples here, a web uh, site, a couple of documents that I have attached. So let's go into an advanced 
search, and this is where I can narrow down and say only search through the, my thought notes or through my thought attachments. In this case, I'm going to rely on those uh, thought types. So I'm going to filter my search by the thought type and say only show me where the word future appears in a PowerPoint document or in a presentation, for example. So I've got thought types presentations, and I'll say OK. And this really narrows down my search. I went from, I can't remember, 10 or 12 results down to just two. And of course, there it is. The winning edge actually contains the word future in the presentation itself. It's not just in the title of the document. It's not in the title of the document, but it's in the content. Um, so I can click to go, and I'm already there on that thought, to go directly to that specific thought, open the attachment, and find what I'm looking for. There's a lot of filtering that you can do with the search and the reports. So I just want to stress that we can go into our advanced search and search by date ranges. So you know, if you know, gosh, there's a document that I used, I can't remember the title, um, and I'm not having any luck finding the, the content. Maybe it was all graphics. Um, but, and I can't remember the title, but I know I recently added into the brain within, within the last month, or it's been modified within the past few months. Try that, uh, try actually modifying your search by relevance of, of time, when thoughts were modified or created. Um, it's a really, really great way to find exactly what you're looking for. And you can always go in and run a report as well. So here in the reports, you see I have an alphabetical listing of all the thoughts in my brain. I can click to go directly to a specific thought, so they're all hyperlinked directly up to the thought, but I can filter these search res results. So show me all of my thoughts that have um, at least one attachment. There's 114, so that's still a lot of content. I'm looking for attachments that have been modified uh, within the past week. So there we go. I have, in this brain, 10 thoughts that have attachments that have been modified within the last week. One of these is going to be that document that I'm looking for that I couldn't remember the title of. And so I can quickly find that information by just simply doing a few reviews. There's Nokia. There it is. It's this on-site visit that I linked in from Evernote. That's the document that I was looking for. I can launch that. Again, the brain will always launch um, your content in its native attachment. So there it's going directly out to my Evernote account. And one last thing that I wanted to share with you, just because you put information into your brain from these online services doesn't mean if you share your brain, everyone has access to your online accounts um, on your on your uh, OneDrive or or uh, or Ever, Evernote, whatever it happens to be, you simply have to share that file with them or make sure they actually have shared access. Because otherwise, um, I'm obviously able to open everything because I'm logged into my account. If I share this brain online and send the link out to my colleagues, if they don't have access, they'll launch and be prompted for a password. So my information is still protected in Dropbox and in OneNote, and it's up to me if I want to share that information with other members of my team before I share links to those files in my brain. And so with that, I think, uh, Shelly, I'll send it back to you to see if we have any uh, questions that have okay, come in on the question panel. I do have them, and I just lost my wireless connection. Oh, still on I'm on board. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Everything was going great, but I, I, I'm constantly reading. So we actually did cover a lot of questions on Evernote, uh, OneNote. We got those, so that's fabulous. Um, real quick, I do want to let you know, I know we're at the hour, so for those of you that need to, to go, there will be a recording uh, posted on our homepage, as well as you'll be emailed that link. And we're going to go another five to ten minutes, just over time, just to answer a few more questions. Um, okay, so we covered the Evernote, we covered OneNote. Uh, no mic on Shelly. Oh, we got to go on speaker. Oh, here we go. I deliberately took mine off so you would get echo. Uh, there Are we, we go. on speaker? Are we on speaker? Thank you, Carrie. Because <laughs> uh, I, I actually I didn't want my uh, mic echoing into Matt, so I, I muted myself. So now let we us know be, how we sound. Now we, should be, on we should be on speaker. So let me just repeat what I was saying. Um, we're, we want to be respectful of your time. So for those of you that do need to go on the hours, since we're about five minutes over time now already, 
We have a recording. It will be published on our homepage, and you will also be emailed the link. Uh, that being said, we're going to continue for another five, ten minutes in overtime. So if you have any other questions, uh, let's go ahead and cover them. Uh, one thing that did come up earlier that I did want to cover, Matt, was information synchronization. So if I okay. want my ideas, if I want those the, those reminders, these connections on my phone or on the go, um, how do I get this off the desktop and onto my mobile device or share it with my colleagues? So Absolutely. In, uh, sharing came in as well as just access through mo mobile device. So everything that Shelly and I have done today have been on our local machines. Um, and what we can do now is take this to the next step and actually sync it online. And there's a lot of advantages to syncing onto the cloud. Obviously, I'll have online access. I'm actually pulling up the brain right now on my phone so we can see what it looks like here as well. But also, this is how we can share our brain with other users and send them links. So what I'm going to do is actually just click on the sync and say OK. And now everything that I've done here today is being synced, updated on the cloud version. And I'll log into my Brain cloud account. So here I am at thebrain.com. And I'll scroll to the top of our site and log in. And now we can do a little side-by-side -side comparison of the Brain online versus the Brain on the desktop. So there it is. Everything that I've done today is available to me online. And here I'm actually opening it right now on my phone. So I've got access on my phone as well. Again, online access is great. I can hop onto Shelly's uh, computer or someone else here at the office, access all of my information by logging into my account. But most importantly, I can actually go into the settings for this brain. So I'll click on the ESOL and go into settings and show you that this brain has actually been changed to unlisted. Now, when you sync your brain to the cloud, by default, it is automatically going to be private. So it's password protected. We use RSA encrypted. encryption. Uh, that's on the upload, storage, and download. So it's very, very secure. Uh, but I've moved this from being private to unlisted, which means it doesn't show up on a public page. We've got an explore page where you can share public brains. Uh, but I can send this URL to anyone I'd like. Like a YouTube that. video. And also Absolutely. a lot of teachers will pick public. And I'm just going to interject because Kai mm -hmm. uh, had a question. Is the brain an effective way to present information to people that are not brain users? We'll get into that. The answer is yes. <laughs> but um, a lot of professors and people that you don't even, if you don't even want to bother having them install the software or anything like that, and you can make the information public, I suggest just uploading it to the cloud and sending them a link. Uh, now if it's private, you can obviously uh, add them as a team brain member and then start collaborating that way. Um, but we do have um, Dr. Baker from USC. They have a huge brain that they share for surgery. Uh, all the surgeons, up and coming sur surgeons, we have a, a video on our site on that. Another cool example is the climatog photographers in our big thinker area on our site. We have Dr. Mark Trexler, uh, just a fabulous brain, everything on climate change. And I don't know how he would present all that information yeah. if he didn't have his brain. And Jerry does the same thing. He's a tech analyst, but you know he'll just send people to his brain to go ahead and, and get his thinking on all kinds of topics. So and yes, here I'll, it's I'll a share very everyone. effective way to present information. So this, I, I wanted to address your question because mm -hmm. a lot of people who are presenting that information to large uh, audiences like to share it on the cloud. If it is public, if not, you can do private sharing as well. But that's uh, part of the mechanics of how to share that Matt's going to get into right now. Sure. And to share this brain with someone else that might not be using the brain, you want to send them a link and they can uh, open up in their web interface and start clicking through their brain. Uh, your brain without actually installing the application. So they just need to have a web browser. Um, and I right click on the background, I go into share, and here's this nice friendly URL rather than grabbing this long convoluted URL at the top. We've got that uh, sort of truncated down below. So that's a really easy URL to send out in a tweet. Uh, send in an email and share with others to start browsing through your brain. Now, as Shelly mentioned, you can keep your brain private and still share your brain, but those other brain, um, the other visitors would need to have a brain account to log in. It's private, and you say only share this brain with 
And here I'll show you how that's done. I can just simply type in an email. So once again, I go back into settings. This brain is going to stay private, but I can type in an email. So if that email address is associated with the brain account, they can see your brain in read-only mode right here on the uh, uh, right in their web interface. Right. So a couple of different ways to share your brain. And that's a good point because the default, obviously, if I'm, I'm creating public brain, they will have the ability to navigate search. They won't have the ability to edit. Right. Uh, likewise, by inviting someone as a reader. Now, that being said, if you want them to be, do more and collaborate, you can add it as a team brain user. And then even when you do that, you have to select editor versus reader. Um, so there's, and, and then they can collaborate with you on the cloud or through syncing the, their desktop app with yours. And as you can see, I'm logged or in right now, app. obviously, as an editor. Right. I can add new content right here from the web interface. I can add new thoughts and new content from my phone, on my iPad. We also have an Android app as well. So you can edit in the web interface. You can access your brain from your mobile devices and keep that brain in sync between multiple locations. So I'm here at the office today, but I've got a lot of work to do in this brain at home over the weekend. I'm simply going to keep my home machine synced to my account and all the changes that I made here today. And you can see if I go into... Uh, clients, and here's my new category. So all these changes that I made today for Power Surge and all of those links, that's all accessible to me from the cloud, as well as any other machine that I'm syncing to my cloud account. So easy access to all of your digital information. And let's keep in mind, because there are a couple questions coming in from Patrick and Donna about the, the mobile apps and what we can do in mobile. When I'm syncing to the cloud, as long as I have installed, we can do iPhone, iPad, Android, uh, go to iTunes, download the Brain app, or go to the, the Google Play and get the Android, and uh, you can modify your brain on your phone. Um, so I can go in, I can add a note, I can, now the only thing that I don't think, well, and maybe this is just because I'm on iPhone and I don't even have the ability to edit some documents on my iPhone, but you can edit an internal file and That's save right. it on your phone. That's right. I, yeah, I, I don't do no... that on my phone. That might be something that we'll, we'll, we'll work with in future versions, but you can edit thoughts. You can create a brand new brain. You can type in a note. You can access your note. So you can do modifications to the brain itself. Uh, if you want to get into modifying a file, you can launch that file and look at it, and you can add other things to your mobile brain. You can add a, a file or a web link from your phone. Uh, but then it's there. But to modify that, you, you want to use the web or, or your desktop. Um, and uh, I guess, Patrick, you're asking, uh, can they expect a mobile share feature on the Brain Cloud? Uh, not exactly sure. Well, you know, we're happy to take new feature requests. Um, and, you know, I think what, yeah, of that. what you might be referring to is a mobile share. So if you want someone else to have on, on their iOS your copy of the brain, obviously we can do that through Team Brain. You're an editor of that brain, so you have access, editor access, and you have access to that on your phone. We are making a lot of really, really um, great developments with the brain application. We've got a lot of new ideas in store. And uh, along those lines, there's going to be uh, some great, great new mobile capabilities. Uh, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag right now, but I'm very excited about it. And uh, a lot of great new features. And uh, in particular, that's, uh, that's one particular area that, that we're focusing on to give other people uh, reader access to your brain. Now, that being said, you can do this now. And the way you can do it is you can embed your brain on a URL. So if you're running a blog or you've got your own website, um, the climatology brain like we talked about, um, that is available online and you can open up your web browser and go directly to that climatology brain and, and, uh, and, and view it on your mobile device. So there are some really, really great options uh, that are available for you. And we intend to improve upon those and make them easier for you to use in the future. All right. And Jared wrote in, uh, it might be worth mentioning that specific thoughts in a public brain can be made private. And that's true because oh, okay. actually last week, wasn't it last week? Yeah, we did Jerry McCulk here maybe two weeks ago, his webinar. And he's got a ginormous brain, but he also has private thoughts on his um, 
in his brain that he doesn't public off, publish online. So if you, if like 90% of the thoughts in your brain you do want to make public, but there's a small portion, you can go private. The other thing I'll do for safety is I, I segment, I will, uh, I have my ShellyHadeup.com, which I keep private, but then I, I took out, I copied and pasted a bunch of thoughts from my marketing section and migrated that into its own brain that is now public. So there's a couple of ways to deal with access control. So Matt, I, that maybe we'll talk a little bit about, about that. Sure. So the private brain is here back on the desktop version of the brain is where I go in and uh, determine which of the thoughts I want to be private before I uh, put this out on the cloud. And I simply check the private box or uh, a little bit more of an advanced feature, but I can control click. Now I'm, I'm, I'm actually on my Mac today, but I'm running in PC mode. Uh, so control click to add thoughts to your selection box. If you are on a Mac, it's simply a command click. Adding thoughts into the selection box, so I can select a group of thoughts and I can navigate through my brain and one by one from time to time, I just uh, control click, add that thought into the selection box. Then I right click in the selection box and can set the privacy for all of these at once. So like Shelly said, if you've got a large brain, 98% is public, but there's a grouping, there's a couple 50 or 60 thoughts. Um, meticulously go through, review your brain, and, and add those into your selection box, and then really quickly, all at once, take these, I only have five thoughts, I'm going to make them private. So simply mark those five thoughts, really quickly, all is private, now I simply resync. I will still see, I'm logged in as an editor, I will still see my private thoughts. You're logged in as you. Yes, I'm logged in as I, I'm me. So I will see my private thoughts on the web version and on my mobile devices. But the private thoughts but are a different color at, on your desktop or are yep. they still? So that's a nice yeah. way to know, so like that extra red. reassurance to know, okay, yes, I did set this private. Yes. Right? And then when you click on the thought properties, can you show us again? Yes, so here we are on the thought okay. tool tab and there's uh, a private, there's a private check. Right there just a little extra reassurance yeah. for you there as well. Yeah, but when you share this screen with other people that are read-only users, they will not see your private thoughts. So that's how you can, uh, can protect yourself there. Okay, great. And while that, I don't know if that's synced already, if we want to go to that, I'll just let, um, we're going to kind of close the session soon. Great questions. Thank you all of you. We covered so much ground today. Um, and you're still on asking questions. Hats off to you guys uh, for diving into this topic as deeply as you have with us. Uh, Eugene also had a question on a way to make to-dos and scheduling. Oh, great. But, so, yes. Uh, from time to time, it's really great. Uh, of course, I like to go into those notes, and my to-do lists are typically checkboxes, but we give you a lot of different options within the brain. Some people like to simply have a thought called, this is my to-do list thought. You visit that thought, and, and maybe other thoughts are linked to it. Uh, so to-do is uh, work on my power surge client. To-do is rebuild my apps 04 uh, server. So they're all linked to a thought called to-do. You can create a thought type called to-do. I like to create a, um, an actual tag. So these tags are to-do lists. And that's sort of what Shelly showed us with the, you know, this thought is on the runway. This thought is at 10,000 feet, 20,000 feet. So it's a, it's a to-do list, but there's an urgency level included as well. And then there's also check boxes too with notes that I know you you actually like to use. I do quite a bit. I use those check boxes, and I'll even jump over into my personal personal brain. Uh, and here we go in my Matt Caton brain. I'm just going to really quickly take you to a project that I'm working on, and of course, right here, I've got my master checklist. So this is something recreational that I'm working on. But again, as things get completed for a project that I'm working on, you can see I'll check them off the list. And I'll timestamp them as well. So uh, from time to time, let's say I get some things done, I'll check that off the list, make a space, and quickly add timestamps. So I do that for recreational hobbies and activities that I'm working on, as well as uh, with clients. Check boxes are just a really, really great way to, uh, to manage a project. But also, we can set up reminders for thoughts as well. So with the calendar, let me go back to uh, my easel. Let's say my reach out ad campaign is coming up and I can go to the calendar. And anytime I have a thought as the active thought, I can click to add a new event and I simply set up a reminder for this. So first, first 
run with client. So my first run with client will be on, I'm going to make this back in time. Let's say this is, it was supposed to happen on the 22nd, just so you can see what the pop-up reminders look like. And yes, I do want the brain to give me my reminder, so I'll save that. And there's my little pop-up reminder. Now, the brain itself is not an email application, so it's not going to email you this reminder. But with the brain, we can also go in to click on File and sync the calendar with your Google Calendar. So there are a lot of different options and customizations that you can do with the brain. And then uh, that's a one-way sync. Everything that's in the brain calendar will be synced over to your Google Calendar. And from there, you can set it up to receive email reminders for events that you're creating. So a lot of different ways to maintain uh, to-do lists and reminders and events within the brain as well. Right. And I think with that, we're going to end today's session. Um, for those of you that, you know, maybe we've overloaded you and you just wanted to learn how to create a basic brain, you join us tomorrow for the Brain 101. is at 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can pop in and out that get all your questions asked. There was a special thanks, I think, from Patrick, who loved your web your web sources. Oh, great. You know, the link to the Evernote and the OneNote and all that, great. that kind you. of stuff, too. Yeah, maybe we'll even do a specific seminar on all, uh, you know, Web 2.0 data sources. Um, and again, there will be a recording. Um, so I guess for all of you, I would encourage you uh, to go ahead and uh, create that place specifically designed to keep you above the spray of all the information. Think of your brain as sort of the, the tower above it all that gets to link and connect to these things that gives you that view that gives you that aha moment, moment that relaxation, um, so that you can uh, take control of all the information rather than it interrupting and taking control of you. So on that note, I think we'll end, but before we do, Matt, any other final last-minute words of wisdom? Sure. Well, thanks, everyone, for joining us uh, today. And um, also, there's a wealth of resources available on our website at thebrain.com. So a lot of specific tutorials on, on individual topics, creating a thought type, creating tags, integrating with different file types, and so forth. So um, all in the support area of our website. And of course, if you have further questions, you can always contact us at support at the brain.com. We're happy to hear from you. All right, great. Well, thanks to everyone. Hope, uh, hope to see you on future uh, Brain Technologies web event. We look forward to you. Our next event will be nonlinear project management on April 7th. So you can join us in 101 this Friday or the following Thursday or April 7th for all about nonlinear project management. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thanks.